All right, welcome to Madison College's School of Professional and Adult Continuing Education's Continuing Wednesday's web Wednesday webinars. Uh, my name is Brian Landers, and I welcome you all to the webinar today on preventing workplace violence. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, I will have time at the end for any questions or comments uh, to which you can um, just uh, shout them out to me when we get to that point, or you can also feel free to use the chat box uh, to find the chat, bot, chat box. If you use your mouse and scroll over the center part of your screen, you're gonna see a little kind of a talk dialogue bubble there. And if you click on that, you can go ahead and chat anything you want. Uh, to everybody else or to me or uh, answer or throw out a question there. So, uh, and um, uh, also if you, um, when you are entering the, the uh, webinar, uh, you're automatically put on mute. Um, the, the bubble to the far left is the microphone bubble. If you, you probably see this highlighted red. If you click that uh, again, it will take the mute off and then you could also uh, ask your questions. So, and if you have a question that's just so urgent or it's it's, it's just you know um, regarding the, what we're going to be talking about, it, you're more than welcome to <laughs> throw it up there or to um, or chat it away as we go. So, all right. Uh, with that, let's get started with our actual webinar here. All right, so um, if you've had me before in any of the webinars, you know who I am, but I'm a full-time faculty member with Madison College, primarily in the criminal justice area, but I also work for the School of uh, Professional and Adult Continuing Education and Business Training. And I served 19 years in law enforcement. Um, I also was elected to the three terms in the Columbia County Board of Supervisors, and I was also elected to three terms as mayor of the great city of Wisconsin Dells. After three terms, I said, I'm done with this. <laughs> uh, and I just I just strongly believe in term limits. Uh, and the college had a lot of work for me, and I just said I just don't I just don't have enough time in a day anymore. Uh, but I enjoy definitely the time that I've spent in office. And I'm enjoying uh, the time that I spend uh, even more out of office uh, with my wife and my daughter and going fishing and doing fun things. So uh, I have a master's degree, I'm working on my doctorate uh, degree, and I uh, have a specialty in threat assessments and crisis management, uh, active shooters, workplace violence, all, all the things that help keep people in places safe. Uh, I played a role in that with Wisconsin Dells when I was with the police department there for 19 years, and also as uh, the mayor. So I bring uh, my knowledge and, and my education and research to individual businesses now. Uh, on behalf of Madison College. So the objectives that we're gonna go through today is, uh, you can kind of read them there, but we're gonna talk a little bit about a Ferris wheel. We're gonna talk about taking a pulse and we're gonna talk about doing investigations. So what does that all mean? Well, first let's talk about that Ferris wheel of life. Boy, there's a lot of little cars in that Ferris wheel of life, aren't there? Um, and what we have to understand about workplace violence, and, and, and really, there's a lot of different types of workplace violence, right? There's bullying, there's active shooters, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, incidents of, of robberies and threats and stuff like that. And one slide I didn't put in here, but um, I want to kind of uh, give you some parameters, is that the chances of you dying, or let me take that back, the chances of you being involved uh, or impacted, by a tornado in Wisconsin is something like 200 and something thousand to one. The chances of you being around or victimized of a crime at work is like 20 to one. But we'll go through tornado drills and we'll go through fire drills and all that stuff. But workplace violence is kind of weird because, you know, we know what a tornado is, we know what a fire is, and we know kind of, you know, how they're caused and how we can prevent them. But workplace violence is, is well, there's just so much of it. And it's it, it, there's just so many opportunities for it. So really we kind of have to get to the roots of the problem. And the way I'm going to address this is I'm not going to address workplace violence as something like uh, a robbery, okay, or a kidnapping or a hostage taking or anything else like that. I'm talking about what I think a lot of you are interested in is that, you know, your employees who could lash out and become harmful to other people or you. So that's the approach I'm, I'm taking with this. And to kind of get to the root of the problem, 
we have to look at the Ferris wheel of life and understand that most people, it's, it's not in their, in their disposition to be violent with other people. Matter of fact, we, we have been cultured and socialized out of the animalistic, uh, animalistic instincts that cause us to be violent. You know, if we were back in the, in the caveman and woman days, we would be more prone to violent with violence with other people when we would have to potentially fight over mates or food or territory. But we really don't have to do that very much anymore. Okay, we don't have to duke it out to, to buy a house or to go to the grocery store or anything else like that, right? So we have ingrained ourselves, although there's a lot of violence in society, still when you look at things like violence and murder and robberies and stuff like that you know those are people do going through extreme actions because you know they're trying to get something or prove something or fighting over territory and things like that but what about workplace violence when really the, the, there's those big factors aren't involved well what factors are involved in the in the root of a lot of workplace violence is the loss of things in a person's ferris wheel so as you kind of look around the ferris wheel and see all the different all the different um, carts uh, on this Ferris wheel, all the different things that, that you and I can uh, identify with. What happens when one of those carts isn't operating right? Or what happens if we lose one of those one of those carts? What happens if we, you know, if a, a spouse or relationship, if something goes south there, um, a child, if, if one of our children are, are, are hurt or, or seriously injured or, or potentially die? Anytime that there's a, a shakeup of any one of these cards, the Ferris wheel gets off balance. And that affects our mental health. People that, that uh, typically people that cause workplace violence uh, do not suffer from mental illness. Now, there, there, are, there are cases or there are some research that says, you know, that they might have a history of, of some degree of, of depression and anxiety, which is a form of mental illness, but not necessarily your schizophrenic type of, uh, or, or um, psychopathic type of, of mental illness that is more prone to violence. These are people that are very high functioning in life, but something has occurred in which has uh, caused their Ferris wheel to become uh, unstable. And they have a hard time with coping with it. And then the stresses of the things that they have normalcy in become more problematic. And where do they probably have the most normalcy or attempt to try to show normalcy is at the job site, okay, or with their employer. You know, at home they might crash and burn or face the realities of their Ferris wheel, but at the job site, um, they might have to try to put on a different face and then that stress kind of gets them. Or on the flip side, if their uh, job uh, as uh, the, one of the top of the things that we have here with our uh, Ferris wheel, if that's on shaky ground, or if they feel like it's on shaky ground, then even that that uh, environment of normalcy becomes difficult for them. So what this Ferris wheel is meant to represent is a way for you as decision makers to kind of understand and get into the, the, the mindset of people that are showing signs, uh, early warning signs of potential employee violence. And for you to start kind of being a little bit more of a, um, I don't want to say a snoop, but an investigator or a caring person to try to find out if there's something going on with this Ferris wheel, because it's going a little off kilter here. So what are some of the early warning signs that, that we typically look for and think of? Well, obviously aggression, right? Somebody who is, you know, there's, there's always going to be, be people who are a little bit more forward and aggressive and say what they want to say and do what they want to do type of people. And we understand that. And, and, and if, quite frankly, if you've hired those people and those people are working out well in your organization, you know, maybe they, they don't have the best political correctness or, um, you know, m maybe they're a little bit more brash, but they're functioning and that's normal to them, you know, then it, if that works for you and that works for them and everybody else, then then so be it, okay? Because there's always going to be different personalities. We get that. But what about a person who starts to become more aggressive? By more aggressive, you could, you could see them talking more aggressively, becoming a lot more impatient, so not only just being impatient, but acting aggressive with their impatience. 
they're not tolerate they're not tolerable uh, to other employees. Uh, the other employees are kind of distancing themselves from them because they say, you know, that this person's just not acting right. You might see signs of, of bullying, both as the aggressor and the victim. Uh, defiance that maybe they don't like a new ro work rule, so they start to defy it. Maybe they they're not. Uh, dressing as they should for the workplace. Maybe they're supposed to be wearing a uniform or safety apparatus. Because I'm not going to wear that. Withdrawal. And a lot of times you see that when uh, withdrawal uh, really is a major a signal of potential instability in a person's life. When the person that was was always involved in things with the with the uh, your fellow employers and, and meetings and things like that, and all of a sudden they're distancing some, themselves from that. They're no longer sociable uh, at work. They become more isolated and quiet and things. That's showing a, a, a major internal struggle uh, that they're having. And it's something that you need to, to pay particular attention to. Withdrawal, one of the top signs that, you know, there's been um, limited studies on workplace violence. It's unfortunate. And I say limited because um, there hasn't been very broad ranging studies, even with, with uh, workplace active shooters and things like that. Um, there have been studies on, on active shooters and uh, e even the, the active shooters that occur at work, but they're more specific case studies of those people, not, not broad ranging different types of studies. But what we do see is that when you do look at those case studies, one of the patterns that you typically see in workplace violence that leads to an act of attempted or, or completed homicide is the person showed signs of withdrawal leading up to the shooting. So that withdrawal, that isolation is the same thing. Fixation, maybe the person has a, a fixation of violence or guns or weapons or things like that, or fixation upon a per certain person. Maybe it's you, if you're the boss or the supervisor at work, maybe their fixation is on you. And it's not a fixation that, you know, you know, gee, I love you and I think you're great. It's uh, the negative fixation that, you know, that they cannot stand you. They're always butting heads with you. They're arguing with you. They're trying to uh, circumvent things or, uh, get people to side with them over you. It's a power struggle, whatever, okay? And also appearance. You might notice a change of appearance. And typically that's going to be a negative change in appearance. Maybe they're not uh, dressing as, uh, you know, as professional as they should be. Maybe you notice that they're, you know, um, you know e even like their reports, um, their productivity <clears throat> is not as good as it used to be. Their customer sales or customer uh, service skills are not what it, what it uh, used to be. It's just a lot more than just physical appearance, but it's also the appearance of how you want them to project themselves to your stakeholders and your fellow employees as well. So what you need to do is you kind of need to take a pulse because depending on how large of a workplace or an org organization that you work for and, and, and to what level that you hold in that organization, you might be very well removed from a lot of these early warning signs. You may not know about them. You know, if you're working, in, let's say that you know you, you're working in a, as an executive or supervisory level, and you're out of the office or out of the workplace by four or five o'clock at night, but there's the afternoon shift and the midnight shift that's also working. These are things that you may not be aware of that are occurring if if you're not on the floor, if you're not watching and interacting with the people that um, represent your organization. So taking a pulse, which means don't hide your head in the sand. It's really easy to kind of chalk things up as, well, maybe they're just having a bad day, or maybe they're just having a tough time, a tough, a tough road in their life, or, you know, that's just a personality issue between that person and the other person. <clears throat> don't ignore what you sense, and I'm not always saying what, what is told, because we're going to talk about that next, but what you sense is occurring. If you sense that there's problems, then take a pulse of those problems and try to find out what is going on. Don't wait for the problem to come to you either. If you have a sense that there is something going on, and you see it by the reaction of other people, that maybe, you know, employee A who is a problem employee is impacting the rest of the work group, 
uh, don't wait for somebody from that work group to speak up. If you if you have knowledge of it, if you sense it, if you see it, hear it, whatever, you need to kind of take a pulse of what is going on and try to find out what is going on. That's your job to do that as a decision maker. Another thing that we look at, and when we do have a uh, post workplace violence incidents of active shooters or violence and things like that is what did the people know about the person? <clears throat> Excuse me. What did the management know? And a lot of times managers will say, I kind of suspected something up, but I didn't, you know, I either didn't know what to do or I was afraid to say anything or I just figured, you know, it was just the person was just having a tough time in their life and, you know, that that it would straighten themselves, you know, they would straighten themselves out at, at a certain time. So making sure that you have a pulse of your organization is critical. Don't wait for an act. I, as a consultant, I've, I've talked to many uh, uh, CFOs, CEOs, HR directors who have said, you know, we feel like, you know, legally we can't take action until they do something. Well, you know, if you're coming to me as, as an outside consultant saying, you know, hey, we have a problem, then you need to do something. If you're waiting for the act to happen, then you could potentially, you know, have uh, a much more serious problem. Um, I remember an HR person uh, who was talking with me about this and they said, well, you know, we don't want to get in a, a lawsuit for um, unlawful termination. And I said, yes, but you know, you have a violent employee that is bullying much of, many other employees. So what would you rather have? A potential lawsuit which really would hold no water at all of a lawful unlawful termination or a wrongful death suit by the estate of any of your employees that this person could potentially kill that's going to hold a lot of water because you knew about it and you didn't do anything okay so don't wait for those those acts take action <clears throat> all right so what does true prevention actually look like Overall, it's a culture, and if you've if you've been through my webinars before, you know I preach culture in a workplace, culture, culture, culture in a workplace, because culture drives normalcy, culture drives desired performance. We've known that since the dawn of civilization, before we had written rules about paying taxes and speeding and and um, you know what we can and cannot do. A lot of the basics in life were unwritten rules and just understood because that was the culture. You don't rape, you don't steal, you don't kill. Uh, you know, you, there's there's whole things that are just common knowledge that you just don't do so that people can get along with each other. So having a culture in the workplace is by far the number one prevention of, of a culture that does not tolerate any type of workplace violence, but yet is actively keeping their pulse on the workplace to provide employees resources so that they know they're not alone in their ferris wheel of life should something uh, happen to them so what are some things you could do no number one compliments are free it's awfully hard to get mad at a person and it's really hard to be uh, violent towards a person if they like you so giving compliments, give compliments what things are doing. It doesn't have to be, you know, a compliment, you know, uh, uh, always about, you know, how they dress or how they look or anything else like that. We can give compliments on their performance. We can give compliments on um, uh, how nice, you know, that they're always seemed uh, well organized. Um, that, hey, I overheard you take a phone call uh, to a customer and I just want to let you know, I really appreciate um, how you treated that customer. Uh, you did a really great job on that, okay? <laughs> compliments are free and as decision makers sometimes we don't throw them out enough you know we're quick to, to to point fingers and say you didn't you didn't meet our expectations but when people are meeting or exceeding our ex our expectations how easy is it to just to say hey i really like that or i think you're doing a great job uh throwing out compliments also leads to that culture because if they see the leader complimenting other people they too are going to want to uh, imitate that and give compliments well. They, they understand that in that culture, 
praise is given in public, obviously, and discipline is given in private, right? But when that praise is given, it's also something that makes people feel good, and then they want to uh, want to share that. Offset the stress. Do some fun things every once in a while. Maybe have a uh, potluck lunch. Maybe have something. Um, something we're starting at Madison College, which I'm really excited about, is we. Um, I'm not a big social media person, but we're having this thing on social media in which uh, employees in the college can share their hobbies with other people and teach them things. So I love to go fishing and I, I do a lot of fishing. I do competitive fishing. Uh, so um, I am tasked next week with giving um, fishing tips and posts and doing a, a live fishing webcast with fellow employees that maybe wanted to learn how to fish, but never knew how. So now I'm sharing my experiences and they're gonna have things like knitting and crocheting and learning how to play guitar and book clubs and all these things. These are things that you can easily set up that don't really cost a, a lot of money to do. But again, that, that, that aids in that culture and it provides more of somebody to, to let them know a little bit more about themselves uh, it, to their fellow employees and their managers and share some things that they may be very good at. So um, offset the stress with some fun things. Again, it could be luncheons, maybe you surprise uh, the group with you know, donuts in the morning or something like that. You know, keep them on their, keep them on their toes, but keep them on their toes in a good way. That, you know, uh, that management and decision makers are always so surprising us with nice things or doing things that, that enrich us even more as employees. Also set expectations. <clears throat> that you're not only going to do formally through policy of having an expectation of what that is, but also again through your own leadership circle of what those expectations are. You might have a supervisor that you know, can, you know, might uh, uh, show us some of these signs that we talked about. Maybe they isolate themselves, and maybe they're, they're a little bit more aggressive and uh, things like that. And and. Uh, you know, it's like, hey, you know, we're, we're trying to present this uh, as what we do as, our, as leaders, but you're not following in this. So make sure that you, you set those expectations, but those expectations are not just at the ground level. They're not just for, you know, the, the grunts of the workplace, okay? They're for everybody to follow. And, and as you move up in that supervisory chain, then your level of expectation of how you act, how you treat other people, how you compliment, how you how you are innovative uh, must rise as well. And again, know your people, value your people, and empower your people. So know your people. Again, taking that pulse of all the different types of, of, of workers and the shifts that you have and uh, surprise them. Maybe come in and work a midnight shift uh, with them. To see how they're how they're doing, or right? allow them to to uh, see you. Uh, maybe you have delivery drivers. You know, go out there and and uh, spend a day doing a delivery with them. So that's and trust me, word will spread. If you've got a hundred delivery drivers, but you choose one to just go on a route with one day, you don't have to go visit all one hundred. I guarantee you, by the very next day. All 100 of those delivery drivers are going to say, hey, you know what he or she did? They, they went out and they did a, a delivery uh, run with them, not just to critique them or anything else like that, just to see what their job was like and, and learn more about it and see how they're doing. That, that will pick up even those people that weren't physically, okay? So getting to know your people and showing value in, in your people and, and, and placing the value of their life as your number one goal. A lot of times in business, what is our number one goal? Our number one goal is to, to make profit, right? No, Reshape, re, reshape that. Is that the number one goal in your business? Is to provide a safe culture for the people in and doing business with you. That's your number one goal. Because if you don't have that, you don't have profit. It's as simple as that. Something bad happens at your place and your place becomes a, a, a interrupted or a place of avoidance, there goes your profits. So value your people and let them know that their life is valued above everything else. And empower your people. Make sure that your people have avenues that if they are hearing or seeing something or they are concerned, 
that they can come to you. Okay, again, that's part of the culture. But also, make it so that the people that are having problems, whose Ferris wheel has been erupted, know that they can also come to you and that you will provide them the services, excuse me, or at least the understanding that they're going through, through a rough time. You don't have to pry, you don't have to become a therapist, but at least allow them that, that I hate using that, that, that cliche though, you know, my, my office door is open anytime. Don't ever say that to people, okay? Get out of your office and go to them and let them know, you know what, if you're, if you're having problems or there's something going on, you don't have to give me the details, just give us a heads up, you know, that, that we might need to have a little bit more patience with you. That's all we're asking, okay? So all the niceties of prevention, but sometimes prevention takes a little bit more firmness, okay? So be firm in your policy adherence of what that expected culture is supposed to look like and, and be like, and take action when there's a violation of it. Be equitable, don't play favorites. Don't let other supervisors play favorites as well. Expedite the concerns, don't sit on things. As a former law enforcement officer, people complained about me, and I was a great guy. I'm a nice guy. I didn't do anything wrong. But, you know, if I give a person a speeding ticket and they didn't like it, sometimes they complain about me. And there's nothing more disheartening than, than uh, to have your, you know, in my case, my chief say, you know, you had a citizen complain against you. For what? Because you apparently you gave them a ticket and they said that you were rude to them. All right, well, everything was on videotape. You can go watch it. And, but even though you know you've done something right, there's nothing more disheart disheartening than to hear someone has an issue with you, okay? So if you are going to investigate things or if you, uh, if you do have to, to look into something, expedite these concerns. Try to wrap them up quickly and, and uh, we're gonna go through those that steps of the investigation as I'm gonna show you in a little bit. But make sure that you don't leave people hanging, not only for the victim, not only for the potential offender, but also all the people of the workplace. And no matter how hard you try and telling people don't talk about it, they're gonna talk about it. Everybody's gonna know something is uh, going on here, okay? When you investigate, investigate thoroughly. We're gonna uh, do that next. And then uh, seek outside resources if you need to. If this is something that you know you might be uncomfortable in dealing with, uh, and also part of that uh, uh, culture, okay, is that you might use an outside resource to do you know some of the investigation and some of the some of the determination, so it kind of you know removes you from it, so they don't take it you know they're not taking this as a personal attack upon them from their foreman or supervisor or anything else like that. Do not use training as a punishment. And goodness gracious knows I've been there multiple times. Somebody in my in my workplace screwed up, so everybody has to go through training. Okay. Don't do that. Okay. Because then training is looked at as a negative thing. Training is, you know, training should be very positive in nature. If you recognize that there's problems and there's and there's issues that persist. Sure, training can help provide that, but don't use it as a form of punishment. Don't say because, because we noticed that, that this person wasn't doing the right things, everybody's gonna be trained now on how to do the right thing, okay? That's just, that's just not the way of, of going about it. Don't use a shotgun approach, which kind of goes hand in hand with using training, training as a punishment. Um, I've always said, you know, if you got a problem, use a rifle, not a shotgun. Deal with the problem. Deal with the person or people that are the problems. Don't deal with the entire group. And sometimes I think a lot of managers try to do that because it, it takes a little bit of heat off of them, where they might try to say, well, you know, if I treat everybody like this, or if I try to lump everybody together, then those people that are truly the problems may not try to isolate uh, me or think that I'm coming down on them. You know, I mean, I was a sergeant, I was a lieutenant, I was a academy director, um, you know, I was a, uh, a county board supervisor, and I was a mayor. I held a lot of positions of decision making, and uh, through that time, I had to discipline people, suspend people, terminate people, uh, and they didn't like me for it. Oh, well. But it, it wasn't 
me disciplining or terminating because I could, it was because of their actions. Their actions alone cause these issues. And I didn't spread that out because I wanted to be friends with them. I wanted to make sure that they like me. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to just pinpoint them and deal with them. I'm going to, I'm going to throw it out there for everybody. So uh, not only do we deal with them, but we make sure that does, this doesn't happen again. That doesn't work. Okay. And if you need to, discipline and remove. Remember, what we're doing here is preventing potential workplace violence. And you could have, if you ignore issues, again, think to yourself, what would you rather have? A potential a complaints of, of unfair or um, uh, some sort of disciplinary actions or uh, a termination that they didn't feel was right or potential loss of life that that um, that you might feel responsible for. Uh, not only, um, you know, uh, personally, but also legally, uh, also through your employer might feel that, that you did not take actions uh, serious enough and now it led to further actions down the road. So how do you investigate? Well, you inform, you investigate, you determine, you resolve, and through every single step, you document. Inform. Informing is a lot of different ways. First off is you have policies and expectations of how you expect people to act and behave while they're at work, okay? Those are very clear guidelines that you must have. When people violate them, you inform them of that invest, of, of that violation, and then it will be investigated. Now, obviously, if it's something minor, somebody didn't wear the right shirt to work or something like that, that could, you know, potentially just be dealt with, you know, hey, you know, don't do that again type of thing. But I'm talking about acts of things like bullying or um, uh, where there's threats made against somebody else, um, you know, that these are more serious things that they're doing. Um, you know, that is causing a huge disruption and also showing a pattern towards potential violence. So you inform them through policy and then you also inform them that this is gonna be investigated. Then you investigate whether or not you do the investigation by yourself as a potential team, or you use outside resources to assist you to make sure that it's thoroughly investigated. We don't wanna be in, you know, disciplining people who don't deserve it, obviously, and we also want to make sure that our investigation is sound enough to determine where do we what do we do next. Make a determination as to what is best for the organization. It may not always be best for the person involved or the people involved, but what is best for the organization. So you make that determination with those people who are the decision makers of your organization. The investigation team may not be the same as the decision making team. But you make that determination, you provide your recommendations to the decision makers, and then you resolve it. Resolving could be as easy as, you know, it's a simple letter, maybe it's some time off, maybe it's it's mandatory uh, referrals to emergency uh, or employee assistance program, uh, and uh, or maybe it's discipline. Maybe it's getting law enforcement involved because crimes have been committed, but you resolve it. And all through that, you document every single step all the way through. But once the result, once the resolution is, is carried through, it's over. Don't harbor any bad feelings. Uh, make that very clear to them. Hey, once we're, we're done with this, this is what we've decided, this is over, okay? And if it doesn't involve termination or anything else like that, but maybe it involves, you know, that there's, there's a, a write-up against them or, uh, some sort of disciplinary action or time off or demotion or something. Oh, now you're, you're, you're back on a, uh, you know, go, go back to work, do what we want you to do. Okay. Enjoy working here, but we're done with the, we're done with this. Okay. We're not going to, we're not going to keep on rehashing this or opening this back up or anything else like that. It's, it's done. So make it very clear to that person as well as to any of the victims or the impacted people that your that your um, your process has been complete and it's resolved, and you now expect uh, everybody to uh, move on. 
Yes, uh, we do offer a lot of these services. And again, I only, you know, I only get like pretty much a half an hour to kind of run through all this. I'm not going to solve all the world's problems of workplace violence in a half an hour, but I've kind of given you an overview and some tips. Um, but we do offer customized services, uh, including doing that um, investigation piece and consultation piece that uh, you may need or look for, as well as other types of training and things like that. And a reminder that some of our other uh, webinars coming up, you can see that um, um, DV is domestic violence in the workplace, uh, which uh, leads to a lot of uh, workplace violence, uh, and especially violence coming into the workplace. Uh, and then also um, you could see a starting small business, a restarting small business and uh, evacuation and sheltering practices.